Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. So if you have a, a Bible this morning, would you uh, turn to Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 32? I'm going to just read through this passage to kind of tee up our time this morning. Mark 1, verse 32. It says, when evening came after the sun had set, they brought to him all those who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up. He went out and he made his way to a deserted place. And there he was praying. Simon and his companions searched for him. And when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. For This is why I've come. And I, I've selected this text this morning just to, to share on because um, God's doing something in my own life. And, and I think that even Eric prayed it out. And that is that there's this greater sense that there's something bigger. There's something greater for us to give our life to. And oftentimes we settle for the lesser rather than the greater. And I just sense this invitation to lean in and listen for God's voice and his direction in my life and not necessarily take advantage of the grasp that I have and try to manipulate things, but, but let go and be intentional about hearing and, and listening to him. And recently I've just been aware of how many opportunities and things that present themselves to me and our family. Uh, We have two teenage daughters, and um, I I thought we were busy as a family before they hit high school, but once they hit high school, it was wild. They have their own calendars now, so it's like merging four calendars instead of two. And I've just been aware that there's things that continually come my way. There's this abundance of invitations to do this and experience that and participate in in the other thing. It often leaves me feeling kind of like I'm hemmed in or at the mercy of invitation. And I know that there's probably a few of you, more than a few, that they're saying, yeah, that's, that's me too. What do I say yes to? What do I say no to? How do I make decisions uh, of how I steward my time and uh, the talents that God's given me in this season of my life? This can be really difficult uh, to navigate. And I believe that um, how we make these decisions really matter. How we make decisions to give our life away to, to things that we involve ourselves in really matters to our relationships, but they also matter to our discipleship and our spiritual growth. And in this passage of Mark, it sheds a little bit of light on why um, these decisions are so hard to make. And, and I, as I was reading through this, I was just thinking, man, I, I identify with all of these things. Notice that in this passage that we read, um, that these invitations are never presented at the right time. They always find a way to search us out and find us. Oftentimes, we're not looking for them, yet these opportunities find us. And that was certainly the case for Jesus. As he was praying, it said they searched him out and they found him. We're often minding our own business, and suddenly we're interrupted with a choice or an opportunity. That creates a a difficult decision to make. The second thing that oftentimes makes things challenging is this idea that opportunities are always urgent, and they're always important. They're always presented in that way. 
Notice in uh, verse 37, Simon used the word everyone, like Jesus, everyone is looking for you. This is a big deal. It's, it's magnified, the, the invitation is really big. Everyone's looking for you, and, and yet, there was a priority and an urgency put on it like if we don't do it, no one's going to. Everyone. And then the other challenge is this, that opportunities are often really good ones. Very rarely does an opportunity not avail to be good. It's, it's really good most of the time. No doubt that if Jesus went with Simon and his disciples, where they were pulling him to, that there probably would have been healings and miracles and probably demons casted out of people and and freedom that was experienced. No doubt there were great things that would happen if he did that, but yet, this is how Jesus replied. Let's go to the neighboring villages so that I can preach there too. This is why I've been called. I wonder how many of us this morning know kind of the why behind what we do and what we give our life to. It's a real interesting question. I I know Travis over the last few weeks have given us these questions to consider as Jesus is coming in and forming our lives to be more like him. And I think this is a a weighty question to consider. What, What is the why that we use to filter our decisions that we make as we steward our time and we steward our talents? What's the why? And we find here that that Jesus gives us some clues in the way that he lived and the way that he made decisions. And despite all of these things of searching him out and the urgent and the importance and the goodness and the virtue of all these opportunities, he wasn't moved. He was clear in what he needed to do. He knew what to say no to and he knew what to say yes to and, and invite into his own life. And I, I want to be really clear this morning. I, I'm not um, trying to share about best practices on how to, like, get our best life now or to create margin for me time or to uh, even, like, maximize our work productivity. I, I'm not, I mean, those things are all great, but those are not the, the greater thing. I, I think that uh, what I really want to get after at is giving our lives to the greater things and not the lesser things. That's the real thing. That's the real issue of the why. God, what, what's the greater things for our lives in this season that we're living in, in the context that we're living in? He lived a discerning life in the season that he was here on earth, leading these disciples and ministering to people. And he had this missional purpose that was really clear in his mind. Jesus understood his missional purpose. And uh, I I believe that Jesus is able to do this, be missional in his decisions and the way he lived his life because he was simply connected consistently to the Father. And I think if we could grab a hold of anything this morning, I, I feel like that's what God's speaking. Consistent connection with me will change everything. But it's when we become disconnected that, that issues, that the lesser becomes the greater. And in verse uh, 35, it, it actually says that Jesus went away and he was praying. He was connected to the Father. So it was simple to, to, for him to respond with a no, let's go there instead. And I want to look at just a couple um, a couple things, um, little moments in um, the Gospels that just give us a glimpse of, of how Jesus connected to the Father, and then he actually took that experience and he gave it as an example uh, to his disciples on how they could live. And the first one is this. Um, we're going to pick up in John 14. And in John 14, this is right in the middle of like the farewell discourse of Jesus where he had just a short amount of time. So in about four chapters, he began to unpackage what would happen to him and then how his disciples could sustain their lives without him. 
And in uh, chapter 14, verse uh, 27 and 31, this is what Jesus said to them. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I just want to say that again, and I just want us to receive that. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled and fearful. On the contrary, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as the Father commands me. So he was teaching his disciples that what he does, he does according to what the Father commands him. There's this connection where he's listening and he's obeying. He's listening and he's responding to the Father. There's this back and forth rhythm of his life. He hears and he obeys. This was the way of Jesus' life and what was behind the way he lived his life, the decisions that he made and the rhythms that he established. And this is not an easy thing. You know, we can, we can present this in, in a simple few steps, listening and obeying, but it's actually really challenging. And I'm going to share just some obstacles that I've experienced that are probably pretty common to many of us. But the first one is this, that it's not easy to listen and to obey. In fact, there's so much that competes for the listening part. And in fact, in, in Jesus' life, obedience was so important. This is what it says in Philippians. Paul says that Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. There was this abandonment with obedience. Jesus was willing to obey to even the extreme of death. And it wasn't even easy for him. In fact, um, it records in, in Mark 14 that Jesus literally said, Father, all things are possible for you. If you could take this cup away from me, would you do that? If there's a way out of this obedience, could you take it? And then he said, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was grounded in this idea of hearing and obeying. By his obedience, the world knows the Father. And as the church, this is one of our great callings, that the world would look at us and say, man, there's something different about how this person conducts their business or lives out their family, or their relationships seem whole and healthy. There's something different. Our obedience points to the Father. And as a church, that's the the beauty and the hallmark of what we're we're all about, is pointing to God, pointing to the Father. How does Jesus navigate these difficult decisions? He listens and he responds, honoring the Father. D.A. Carson puts it this way, and I love this, about John 14. He says, John 14 builds a contrast between the devil's futile attempts to bring claim against Jesus and Jesus' resolute commitments to please the Father. And what I love about this is this idea of just the, the opposite ways of the world. The devil, the, the flesh, the world, it's all about telling us what we need to prioritize, giving us what we need to give our lives to, bringing claim on our lives. But yet Jesus was resolute in his commitment to please the Father. Man, I love that. Man, are our lives in contrast to the world where we don't allow the world to lay claim on us. Another image or or just glimpse into Jesus' life was recorded in John 10, and this is just a beautiful little image that we can apply to our lives and how we are led by him. And in John 10, it says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls to his own sheep by name and leads them out. 
When he has brought all of them outside, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. What I was struck by was this idea that he goes ahead of us. Man, so often I I actually outrun Jesus. Right out of the gate, I, I just run past him, and then I'm like, are you coming with me? And in his graciousness, he says, no, I'm not going there. I'm going over here. Do you want to do follow me? That's just this beautiful picture of how he goes before us. And to help us understand this passage of scripture, um, it's helpful to have a, a bit of an image of what a Near East uh, sheep pen looks like. And here's just a, a picture of that. And notice that um, when we look at this picture, there's, there's no gate on this pin. It's an open kind of in and out entrance. And that's because the shepherds typically become the gate for their sheep. They literally lay across the gate. And as the sheep go in, the shepherd lays across the gate. And when it's time to go, he gets up, goes outside the pen. And uh, it, it was fun. I, I kind of got stuck hearing all of these different sheep calls. Um, They are wild. Every shepherd has a unique call. And I I should have recorded some and brought them. You you guys would love it. But but the shepherd goes outside the, the pen and he calls. He has a unique call. And the sheep inside the pen hear his call and they know exactly where to go. And there was this fascinating uh, video I saw where three shepherds were at different places outside the pen and each of them called and the mixture of sheep separated and went to the shepherd. Amazing. See, here in the West, we drive sheep with dogs. We, We drive them. But in the Near East, the tradition is to call and they'll follow. Now, what a beautiful image. That God didn't bring us into the kingdom of sons and daughters to drive us. He wants to lead us. The sheep hear his voice and they follow the voice as he leads the way. And you know, that this, is, this is great. I, I know this is um, really, really important to our lives and it, it's valuable to hear the Father, but There might be some of us that are like, man, that's great for you, but I've never really heard God speak to me, or I'm struggling in that. How how does this happen? What do I do? And I want to just kind of unpackage a few obstacles that our lives bump up against that compete with us hearing and responding. And the first one is that oftentimes the first obstacle to us hearing is that we create these categories in our life where God's actually really interested in these things. They're worthy of hearing and listening for. And then on the other hand, we have another category where these things are the lesser and they're not quite as important. In fact, God doesn't really care or he's not even interested. So we live in this dichotomy of this is important and and this is not. So it frames our reference of even coming to him. It creates this condition. And I remember um, one of the lessons I, I learned in life, uh, I was just recently married, and I, I was living with this dichotomy of categories, and I didn't even know it. And uh, we were in the car, and God used driving to help me understand this. A lot can be learned as you're driving, especially with your spouse. Um, so we're, we're driving to this uh, conference, and this conference is a, uh, a prophetic conference, so they had uh, pastors that, uh, and, and prophetic ministers that just had this gift of, of prophecy. They would pray, and, and God would give them just a prophetic word to encourage people by. And there were three that were ministering that night, and um, Colleen and I decided to go. We were living in Long Beach at the time, and, and um, as, as you know, in Southern California, there's no quick way to get anywhere, and we were stuck in traffic and late, so we pull into this parking uh, lot at this hotel, and it was packed, and, and Colleen just looks at me, and she's like, let's pray for a parking space. And I'm like, we're not praying for a parking space. God doesn't care, you know? 
We're going to find one. It's like I have these categories, right? God doesn't care about trivial things like that, you know? So she just smiles and sits, waits till I drive all around and find a parking space. And then we go in to the meeting, and um, about 20 minutes into the meeting, these guys look at us, and they're like, hey, you know, you two, come up here, you know? We're like, oh, me? So we, we go up, and we sit down in these chairs, and um, there's this moment of silence that felt like really long. And uh, he puts his hand on my shoulder, and he says, God wants you to know that there's nothing that's not valuable to him, not even parking spaces. <laughs> and I, I, I felt like, okay, God, I, I get it, you know? And I didn't want to look, but I knew Colleen was like, mm, you know? <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. God, God can use parking spaces. The, the little things in our life that seem so trivial, the Father really, really cares. But yet we, we categorize these things and we limit our ability to, to hear. The second obstacle is we, we simply don't ask him. We don't ask. And if we don't ask, we probably won't listen. And this, this becomes a discipline of life of, of actually like having faith, stepping out and, and saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask. I'm going to be living in the discipline of asking. And um, I recently read the book, uh, The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis, and he paints this picture of contrasting heaven and hell. And it just like any C.S. Lewis fashion, um, he's a, a great... Um, fantasy writer and the images he creates are amazing and he creates this image of heaven that kind of unfolds in this book. And uh, Julius Johnson wrote an article called The Quality of Heaven and the Redeemed. It was a little commentary about one of the chapters. And what caught my imagination was this. He contrasted heaven and hell in this way. He said, in hell, you have only to imagine it and you'll have it. It's like this instant gratification, right? In heaven, you have to do more. You have to ask. There's this quality in heaven of asking, coming before the Father and asking. Charles Spurgeon once once, uh, preached, asking is the rule of the kingdom. We're involved in a kingdom of, of asking. Matthew the Apostle said this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the doors will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks, the door will be open. And this, this is a bit scandalous. The, the open-endedness of this invitation. And Frederick Dale Bruner writes a commentary on this very scripture and he says, the ask passage is noteworthy because of the unconditional character of its promise. Ask what? What are we not told exactly? We're not told exactly that the promise is astoundingly open-ended, but the irony is is that we carry around heavy burdens of wishes that never become asks. We talk to ourselves about our problems in the form of thoughts, worry, and sleeplessness. We might talk about our problems to those close to us, but even we Christians are strangely reluctant to talk about our problems to the Father, to ask. Here Jesus opens the doors of faith as wide as they will ever be opened again and promise and promises a fruitful audience to the Father for the simple asking. Ask. And I love that invitation. An obstacle to our decisions in hearing from the Father is sometimes we just don't ask. As simple as that. And even even in my own life, I I think I'm just kind of like, 
in this place where I'm, I'm leaning in and trying to figure this out and I'm spotting areas of my life that I just, again, blow past him and don't even ask. And even this last week, um, I have a senior daughter that's um, weighing where she wants to go to school and we've been on a few road trips, visiting colleges and figuring out these different programs and now she has like, it boiled down to just a couple, a handful of choices and she's kind of like paralyzed, like what do I do, you know? So, um, you know, the, the teacher I am, I get the whiteboard out or the, the paper and I make a chart and positives and negatives, let's compare, you know, and then that even creates more confusion. And at this moment, she's like, I don't know what to do, you know? And I'm determined not to make the choice for her. And we were sitting on the couch just this week, and we were kind of talking about some things, and it just dawned on me, Danny, did you even ask? So I, I, I said, Caroline, you know what we haven't done? We haven't asked. Would you, would you ask God about your future? and see what he says. I mean, I, I'm a pastor, and I'm reminded like, Danny, you're not asking. Ask me. Put away the positive and the negative chart, the pros and the cons, and ask me. I've got opinion. I've got a, a greater for you, not a lesser. And then finally, um, an obstacle can also be these things that we just make agreements with. These things that subtly in our own hearts and lives, deep down inside, that are very personal and private, that we agree to, and then they create these walls. They wall off our heart to receiving him in certain areas of our life. We can be going along just fine, and all of a sudden, some, all of a sudden something is said, or we experience something, and and it hits that wall in our heart, and it's like we can't receive it or we have a negative response. By agreement, I mean these like subtle convictions that we make, and we begin to believe is true. It happens deep down inside our soul as we have these experiences and, and we form things in life. They usually begin by little whispers. Like, no one will love me. I'll never be accepted and loved. Or life will never turn out the way I've got a plan for or how I've been working hard towards it. There's no hope in my future. Or I'll never experience joy. Or no one is going to come through for me. And it's all up to me to make it happen. Or maybe the whisper says, it's impossible to hear God's voice. So I'm just going to quit. I just can't do it. These little whispers. We hear these whispers and we make agreements with them. And then a conviction develops. And then we begin to really believe it. And then, before we know it, we're living in a certain way. Our behaviors are dictated by our, our beliefs. This past fall, um, I had a moment where I had a, an agreement confronted in me. And uh, I, I grew up in a, a Christian home. My, my parents, until my mom passed away seven years ago, were married 54 years. And um, I, I thank God for my family. And uh, I'm the youngest of three. I have an older brother that's nine years older than me and a sister that's six years older. So my brother and I never really had a close relationship because we were kind of separated because of age. And um, I, I don't even remember why God brought this to mind, but one evening, I, this all just kind of like flooded in. And I, I had these memories of being a, a little, little child. I think I was probably six or seven years old. And multiple times in my childhood, my brother um, made some pretty significant decisions that really impacted our family, really tough. And as a bystander, I would watch my parents just struggle through parenthood. 
not knowing decisions uh, that needed to be made, not knowing how to help him, but then direct him and, and correct the things that he was doing. And it wreaked havoc on the peace of our home. And passively, I was watching this play out. And actually, some of it was even scary. And subtly inside my heart, I'm like, I'm never, I am never going to do that to mom and dad. I'm always going to do the right thing. This all depends on me. That was this agreement that I made as a, as a little, little child. Like, the, the peace is dependent upon me. I've got to come through. And subtly, I, I, I began to live that way, and I would take on responsibility unduly or, or even carry things that I didn't need to carry emotionally. And just at that moment, God brought this to my mind, and I thought, that's an agreement I made. And it's impacting the way I live. There's, a, there's agreements that we've made that we've lived with for years that's impeding our ability to hear from God. And I believe this morning God wants to begin to uncover those whispers. And he, he wants to begin to whisper something different in your heart. So we have these obstacles of these different things that get in the way of our hearing. But then what opens those obstacles up and allows us to break through them to hear? And and I would just simply say this, that we need to begin to remove the categories that we live with. And it might just be as simple as this, that um, pray about really trivial or minor things. God cares. And as we pray into small things, then the bigger things as they come, we're going to be more inclined to go to him. And we can believe and pray for bigger things and hear him. But if we're not going to him with the small things, it's impossible to go with him for the big things. So we need to remove these categories that we live with. Number two, another breakthrough is rather than not asking, we just need to simply start asking. Start with little things, just like um, these categories. Start with little things like your feelings, like, man, why did I respond that way? God, could you help me understand why I got so angry when this happened or I felt this emotion or maybe small decisions to make or a simple need that you have? That, that same season of time when, when God spoke to me about uh, that parking space, uh, Colleen and I were like, both in college, we were struggling financially. We moved out and had a little apartment that we lived in, and things were not like abundant in resource. And um, we were going to go to this uh, wedding, and I had no shoes at all, just like tennis shoes. And um, Colleen's like, you know, I don't think those are going to do. We need to f- we need to find you some dress shoes, you know. And it's like, well. Um, I know the Schlicks would love this. I'm not going to charge it because I can't pay for it. So instead of that, maybe I'll just ask. So we went walking one night, and, and uh, the neighborhood we lived in was like really overgrown with trees, and there was a lot of shade and kind of dark spots along the, the sidewalk. And we were, we were just walking, and, and like I'm, I just simply said, Lord, I'm, I ask you for a pair of shoes. A pair of shoes. Went on walking, and we were talking, and all of a sudden, I kicked this thing, and it, it like, you know, kind of goes ahead of me, and I look down. It's a wallet that's, like, so crammed with money, you can't even fold the bifold. I mean, it's, like, wads of money. In it are checks as well. It looks like rent checks. So it was somebody's wallet that had collected rent from all these apartments that we lived by. And um, I'm looking, there's no, like, no ID, there's, there's no indicator of who this belongs to outside of um, a name on the check. So I'm like, well, I, I guess we can look at these apartment, um, you know, little nameplates and see if we can identify someone. And sure enough, uh, a lady's name that was on a check matched an apartment. So we went up to the apartment and, you know, we knocked and uh, this 
older uh, lady kind of cracked the door open and she's like, hello. And I'm like, hey, you know, we, we found this wallet. And as soon as they said wallet, like the, the door like came open, she grabbed it from me and then slammed the door. And I was literally like, you know, standing there like, whoa, that was quick. <laughs> and before I could turn around, the door cracked open and she gave me a hundred bucks. She's like, thanks for being honest, <laughs> you know. And I thought, yes, there's my shoes. <laughs> start, start asking. And I, and I know that sometimes we can, again, categorize them as things that are eye-centered and things that are kingdom-centered, and this is not important, but this is. But I'm saying the Father really cares. And it's this discipline of asking and hearing and obeying that we want to build in our lives. And then finally, we need to invite the Holy Spirit into our lives to reveal these agreements that we've made that have walled off our hearts. We need to invite Jesus to break these agreements. And I, I just, I want to pause here for a moment and just actually invite the Father to come to us this morning. He's, he's already here, but to speak to us pertaining to these things. And maybe uh, for you, it's a category issue. Maybe for you, it's just simply like, God, I want a fresh faith to ask you to open my mouth and ask. I have these things I just don't know what to do with or decisions to make or what do I say yes to and no to? How do I lead my professional life or my business or my family? Like, what, what do I do? Or maybe it's an agreement that we've made that has just walled our heart off so we can't hear him. And today he wants to open it up and he wants to create this this freedom to hear his voice. So Lord, I, I just pray this morning. And you, uh, you know us intimately. In fact, there's nothing in our lives that you don't know about. Whether it's things that we take pride in or things that we're shameful of or areas that we've been believing to change or even areas that we're experiencing breakthrough in that we're really excited about. Lord, you know it all. And I just pray this morning as we consider these things, how do we live for the greater? How do we hear your voice to know what that is? Lord, I just pray that you'd begin to remove categories that we've silently created that we've just settled on. In fact, God, we, we just repent for judgments that we've made about you and about what you value over our lives. Lord, we just, uh, we pray that would you give us faith to open our mouth and ask. And then, Lord, would you reveal through your Holy Spirit agreements that we've lived with that have just, like, prevented our hearts from receiving you, closed our ears from hearing you, these, these agreements that we've believed that aren't true about us. We need to just invite the worship team back up as we close this morning, and I, I want to share a, a prayer, and I just want to process through it this morning, and if you want to take a picture, you can even take this home, because I don't want to presume that this moment is the perfect timing for God to, to do some ministry work in your life. It might be you walk out that door, and later today, it's like, wham, God's there speaking to you, or, or this week, but in just a moment, we're going to create space this morning, but I, I also want to just leave you with this prayer that you can go with, and even in the quiet of your home, you can, you can pray when you're ready. 
But I just want to pray this out loud, and if, I just want to invite you to close your eyes, and I just want to pray this over you, and I guess just kind of coach you in, into, into this prayer. As he reveals things that we've agreed on that aren't true about us, that have framed how we live right now, he wants to bring freedom here. says, Jesus, you promised. that I would have abundant life in you. I want your abundance in all areas of my life. Forgive me for making the agreement that blank, whatever that is. Forgive me, Lord, for making an agreement that blank. I cancel the agreement I've made now. I no longer believe it. I no longer want to live under this lie about my life. I bring the full work of Jesus, his cross, his shed blood, his resurrection and his life. His authority, rule, and dominion. Between me and this agreement, I also invite you into the pain that brought it and all the losses that I suffered. Come and heal my heart in this place. Free my heart to fully trust you in the name and authority of Jesus Christ, amen. Now Jesus, what do you wanna say to me today? Would you stand with me? Lord Jesus, what what do you wanna say to us today? What area of our life do we need to submit to your lordship today? Lord, I just pray for um, just courage as we, as we leave today. Lord, I just thank you for courage to ask, courage to come to you with things that you're going to reveal to us, Lord. And, and we just thank you that, Jesus, what do you have to say? We want to receive it, and we want to obey. We want, we want to give our lives over to the greater. Lord, we don't want to conform to this world and give our lives over to the lesser. We don't want our lives to be minimized to a Instagram scroll. But we want to give our lives away to something that really matters, something that's significant, Jesus. So... Would you lead us? In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. find Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life And I